this is Sam Gilliam. Uh, basically, this this is um, a long term installation in uh, Dia Beacon. Um, this piece is um, there's there's several galleries that have his work in it there, but this is the this is the main gallery. Um, it is a very large piece. The, these these pieces are at least seventy five feet each, so it, it's it's quite a, a substantial piece. Um, Gilliam's work uh, started out actually. He started out in college doing doing um, uh, figurative, kind of expressionistic painting um, uh, influenced by the Bay Area figurative painters and all that back in the back in the early 60s. Uh, when he moved to Washington DC, he became he actually became influenced by the color field painters. Um, we've talked I've talked about them in the past, but basically people like Morris Lewis who was doing stain painting and and um, uh, Kenneth Nolan, who was doing kind of harder edge things. Sam Gilliam was doing really hard edge uh, abstraction when when he you know first started to work on uh, in in DC, um, but it quickly evolved into these these larger scale stain paintings. Um, how this came about was basically um, he was given a grant um, by a um, an art dealer curator um, that was in Washington D.C. and basically was he was given a space to work in that was large enough for him to be able to just take a roll of canvas and roll it out across the floor and work on this thing, you know, like 150 feet long or 75 feet long and just lay it out and, and do these kind of improvisational pieces. Um, the interesting part about, you know, a black artist, in 1968 with what was going on politically and all that, um, his work was viewed with some degree of skepticism by some of the black critics that were out there at that time. They believed that, you know, there, there should be a political and social edge to, to artwork. And they felt that um, uh, abstraction of this kind was too um, uh, mainstream, more or less. Uh, now, I mean, I think we view it a little bit differently at this point, um, but you know, that was that was stuff that he was hitting up against in in um, in as far as critics are concerned. Um, but all right, I'm I'm going to move into this a little bit more. So the the idea of 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 having the painting be off the wall, become a sculptural object, become more of an environmental piece that you move through rather than looked at on a wall, um, was something that really intrigued him at the time. This is 1968. I'm going to, let's see, go to the next. Okay. And here, here you have on the, on the right, you have a sense of the scale of the piece with that, that person standing in, in the gallery. And the detail and the scale view of uh, double merge is is kind of important. Um, this is literally a painting that you experience inside. Your you know the staining and drip and splatter of the paint, uh, the 
the fiber of the weave of the canvas, the, the fact that it's a material, that it's draped, that it's, that it's not a static thing, that basically every time it's installed, it's going to be different because the poles are going to be slightly different. The placement of things is going to be different. How the light falls on it's different. Um, taking in different angles and different areas throughout the space, you're seeing, you know, like on, on, the, on the left, you see what this is like with that pucker and the, the pole and that kind of almost perspectival um, uh, view of this piece of the, the canvas. So each area of this, you can walk through it and view it as a, a different painting from different, different spots in the gallery. And this detail shows kind of the correlation to landscape. This is 1968. Uh, you know, I looked at these things and are they tie dye? Uh, what's going on here? It's coming off the wall. It's dancing around the room. Uh, it's a bit of a psychedelic carnival that's, that's happening. This is, remember, 1968, you're inside this, this very bright, colorful painting. Uh, So it's really, you know, in viewing it, you're going, you're going around the room and you're seeing all these different angles, even on the same spot, you move a few feet in a different direction, you're going to get a totally different take on the painting. And this is not a new idea. I mean, basically Monet was into creating these surrounded feelings when you go into like the Museum of Modern Art and you go into the gallery where the, where the, the large Monet installation of the water lilies is, you're surrounded by this, you're inside the painting. So Gilliam was just taking this another step further um, and really entering us into it. At the same time as he was painting these other paintings, um, he was still painting on the wall. He was doing these bevel paintings. And these are large scale. They're, I don't have the size on this one, but they're, they're still very large scale pieces. And um, you'll see, you can see the scale of this. This piece is, again, this is a little bit later. He, he um, he was folding the canvas and staining it and letting the letting it seep into the fibers of the canvas and all that and then unfolding it again and stretching it so it had it had a really different kind of texture different different um, feel to it than the draped paintings um, this is something that he's experimented with throughout his career. Now, I'm gonna go back a little bit. Um, Sam Gilliam was born in 1933 um, in uh, uh, Tupelo, Mississippi. They moved when he was a child to Louisville. So he went to um, Louisville University, um, and uh, did, did undergraduate and went, to, went into um, the army for a couple of years and then came back and did his graduate work at Louisville. That's when he moved to, um, to Washington DC. But uh, I'm gonna step back again. His father was a carpenter with the, with the railroad. That figures in, and you'll you'll see why that figures in a little bit later. But you know these beveled edge pieces. You know the, there's a bit of carpentry that went into that, but a lot of his work enters into engineering and and constructing these pieces. So that's that's very much a part of what he did and what he does. Um,
And I believe, I'm not 100% certain where I got this image from. I believe this is a piece from uh, the Venice Biennale from 1975 when he was a representative of the United States there, uh, which was a very prestigious thing. Um, yeah, I'm gonna step into that too. Basically, um, uh, Sam wa is the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Arts in 2015. He's in all the major collections, you know, from, from the Metropolitan, the Whitney, the, the um, he was in the Whitney Biannual for a number of years. Um, his Museum of Modern Art, um, uh, the National Gallery in, in Washington, DC, and throughout the country, he's in, he's in major collections. Um, so, you know, this guy is, is, is a very substantial uh, painter and had a very great influence. Um, okay. And he did, has done major installations, um, much, a lot of public art. Um, scale is very important to him. One of the things he said was basically, you know, when, when I was coming up, basically the, the territory called for, if you were a serious artist, you were making large scale work. So <laughs> he, he did that. He took that one on. Um, and okay. Um, yeah, there's public art projects all over, all over the country. Um, the, these giant draped pieces on this classical architecture was, you know, very well thought out. How it fits with this kind of classical architecture, the, the kind of um, almost the sense of, of, of drapery on a, on a, um, a Greek statue. Um, you know, and, and how it interacts with that classical architecture is really something that was, you know, he spent a lot of time thinking about this. Okay. Now, oh, wait a minute, didn't mean to go that far. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so on, on the left is a picture of Sam Gilliam in his in his studio. <laughs> And it's quite quite a scene. And notice what he's holding in his hand. It's a rake. He used all kinds of implements to get his paint on there. Um, something that the that the color field painters were were known for. I mean, basically they they you know used all kinds of implements to make their marks. Um, on on the right is Jackson Pollock. Of course, with one of his one of his really famous, you know, splatter paintings, and and you know this was this was very much an influence on on Gilliam's thinking. Now, a lot of the guys that that he came up with in the color color field school tried to avoid the handprint, the mark, the gesture as part of their work because the abstract expressions had had kind of staked out that territory and they were trying to do something different than that. They were trying to let color stand for itself. Well, Sam um, wasn't gonna be held back by any of those, those ideas. So he just let it fly, as you can see. Um, and here is Helen Frankenthaler doing one of her pores. You can see her inside her painting, pouring away. And, and on, on the uh, left is one of her paintings. And you can, I think you can see, obviously, the relationship between her and, and Sam Gilliam in this. Okay. 
And these pieces, um, really interesting. Uh, they, they, to me, look like kind of abstracted flowers that, that you know, kind of are, are um, coming up out of the wall. Um, and this is, this is not out of keeping with other color field painters, but they're, they're really lovely pieces as far as I'm concerned. I, I look at these in the buoyant color and the, the kind of funny, wacky shapes that he's making and all that. And here we go. Morris Lewis on, on the left did these floral pieces. So that's where I was saying that this, this floral business comes in, into the picture. Let me see if I can go back. Previous. Okay. So, you know, you can see the relationship between those floral things and, and what Sam is picking up on. And on the right is Kenneth Nolan. And this, you know, this is 1964. So it was long before those drape paintings that, that, uh, that Gilliam got into. Um, and you'll see right here, 1965, Sam Gilliam's version of, uh, of Nolan's piece. He was doing a lot of these hard edge pieces back then. And this was before, you know, letting loose with those, with those canvases. Now, you know, that grant that he got really liberated him in, in a lot of ways. It just let, let him, you know, try things and experiment. At that point, they never expected to sell anything. So uh, he was just, you know, able to let himself rip. Um, Okay, and here you can see, you know, the pre, the the pre and post um, uh, liberation of Sam Gilliam. Uh, you know, the the hard edge piece in 1965, and then 1971. This is a, a lithograph on Japanese paper. Um, beautiful quality. The 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 those linear elements are probably part of the weave of the actual Japanese paper that he was working on. Um, and he was really not afraid to let these things go dark, let them, let them be more expressive, let them you know, be moody. Um, you know, something that, that I think was kind of banished from the color field painters. Um, they were like not into expressive marking and all of that. And this thing is just let it rip. And, and um, and I pulled up a couple of a couple of references. Now this is a this is a Turner from 1835, 1840. And um, I'm gonna go back. And you can see why I kind of like the color, the 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 movement, the the gestural energy in it is is in some ways has a relationship to this. And the other, the other thing that, that, um, that Sam Gilliam was looking at and was thinking about was, was the, the expressionist business. And, and he was not avoiding that. And, you know, he, he admired people like, like Turner, but also, let's see, this is, a watercolor by Emil Nolde. And again, you can see in this, this beautiful color field piece, the, the, the um, 
the qualities in some of, of Gilliam's prints, and I'll, I'll show you more of his watercolors coming up. Um, let's see. But these, these are, again, these are the acrylics. Um, and you can, you can kind of see that, that um, he's not afraid to be moody. He's not afraid to go into uh, kind of turbulent space. But they're also kind of the method that he uses to put this on there, the folding of the canvas, the, the, um, uh, the creases, the, the pouring and staining of, of, the, of the canvas is, is really um, part of the texture of what, of what he's into. There's also this business of spatial stuff that's happening. I mean, the, the piece on the right has this business of, of, of spatial movement by color and tone. You can see how things look like they're sticking out and you know, going back in by the, the tone of the color. Um, And you can also get a sense of the scale of these pieces. Again, very large, 100, 114 inches tall. So, and these again are um, more of the uh, that kind of atmospheric prints. They figure into his process prominently throughout his career. Um, uh, in a way, the, the logic of printmaking kind of puts parameters on, on, on how much, what, what, the, um, what kind of improvisation you can do. What, you know, there needs to be a certain, um, uh, cohesive sense system to how you're putting that, that those layers of color together because each of these colors is on a different plate so you're doing like you know seven to ten different plates that are going printing registering over one another so you're overlaying color over it layering figures very heavily into into Sam Sam Gilliam's work also. Um, and this, the piece on the, on the left is a silkscreen print. It, uh, it may have as many as uh, 30 to 50 colors that were printed over each other to get to this. So it's building up layer upon layer upon layer. Um, the shaped piece on the right is kind of the beginnings of, of something which, which basically he explores a lot more fully. Um, so these pieces are on, on wood panels and you, know, um, you can see kind of like the, the, the layering of paint and there's collage in it. There's, there's pieces of paper that are collaged onto it, but very thick and heavy impasto, heavy paint. Ah, I couldn't find the dates on these, but I'm gonna guess that these were in the eighties and they're really beautiful pieces. There's an arts and embassies program that, that, that's being run around the world. And these are in one of the embassies, and I couldn't figure out which one. But they're gorgeous pieces as far as I'm concerned. I look at these things and I'm like, you know, I see kind of like the the, the gowns that the whirling dervishes wear when they're when they're doing their spinning and dancing. You know, again, back to dancing, movement, um, uh, joyful. You know these exuberant colors that 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 are in this piece. 
he was also very conscious of where his pieces were going. He's, he really thinks about, you know, what, what's the environment that this piece is going into? If he's got a commission, you can bet that he's thinking about it. You know, these pieces have kind of hoops that are sewn into the seam on the bottom to keep them open like that. So that, so that basically, I'm sure that they spin beautifully in the space, but, but they, they also have this kind of thing that keeps them from closing in on themselves and just drooping down. Very, you know, very bright man with, with um, a, a very um, sharp engineering ability. A lot of artists are that way. We, we, we try to think about, you know, how, how is this going to work? How am I going to do this? So, yeah. okay, and this piece, the arc maker. Um, mathematics figures into this thing. You know, basically he's always playing around with, you know, the shapes and the, the, the calibration of, of, of how, these, how these forms interact with each other. You know, they're a duplicate shape. You know, it's two of these pieces. It's kind of a diptych, but, but they don't feel like that. When you look at it and you look at how the, how the radius of the circle is broken on one and, and, and more fully... Um, played with in the other, you know, you can see the, the rake marks from where he raked across this thing when he put a, applied the black paint over the top of the colors that were underneath. Um, how he got that, that, that um, mark in there, you got me, I mean, is it taped off? Maybe, uh, did, he, did, he, did he scratch into the surface to, make that make that circumference come out i don't know he's not telling <laughs> okay and these are mixed media pieces that he did in the 80s they're sewn together again this this gets back to the the geese ben ladies and 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 the 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 quilting and all that these notions were there. They were, they were actually, you know, even, even in, in the eighties, this was, this was around. Um, really interesting. The, the play of the stitching and the thread holding together these pieces of paper and, and, and other, other stuff that's attached and the thick, thick impostos, you know, this thing is stitched straight through the impostos of the, you know, I don't know what kind of industrial sewing machine he got his hands on to do this, but there it is. And here's here's a couple more. the The one on the on the left actually has is on aluminum and has aluminum pieces attached to it. Um, the one on the right again is 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 sewn and stitched together. Beautiful, exuberant color. You know, the guy, the guy was just had a real, has a real color sensibility that, that I, I appreciate anyway. Um, and again, on, on the left is, is a piece by Al Loving. Al Loving was a contemporary black artist, knew uh, Sam Gilliam's work. You know, Gilliam was doing those draped pieces long before uh, Loving entered into doing, you know, his fabric and torn pieces. Um, uh, this piece is in the Museum of Modern Art. Um, and then on, on, the, on the right is Loretta Padaway from the G's Ben Ladies. Um, and I found out that actually a couple of the G's Ben quilts got into a Whitney 
show from the early 70s, which, which was a surprise to me. Um, and it was a show called Abstract Quilts. And Al Loving saw that show and was, was very much influenced by that also. Now, you know, who feeds into who? You know, basically they're, they're all looking, looking at each other. So, you know, uh, and this is, this is back to Gilliam. And, you know, basically his shaped pieces. Um, there's a number of artists that, that pick this up, that this is um, uh, people like Frank Stella were doing these, gigantic three-dimensional um, uh, sculptural wall pieces that, that came out from the wall. They were made of aluminum and all kinds of other stuff and paint. Um, uh, there's somebody like um, um, Elizabeth Murray um, also doing kind of three-dimensional work. And um, so this was kind of in the air at the time. Um, and on the right is, is another piece by Al Loving, which is this kind of buoyant, wonderful thing that he, he did, did a bunch of these pieces. Um, they're just really zany, uh, <laughs> though they are well-structured, the interplay of form and color, you know, these, they're, they're well thought out, but they're also really fun. I mean, just buoyant pieces. And, and on, on the left is uh, a Al Loving, I mean, uh, a Gilliam uh, sculpture, which, which, you know, plays, plays around with the same sort of wackiness. A in the kitty. I don't know what it means. <laughs> Okay, now this is a this is a really large Gilliam piece. Sam Gilliam said that he really loved um, um, Mondrian, and the early pieces that he was doing when he first got to DC were very much along the lines of geometric abstraction, uh, played around with that structure. Well. This one is called homage to square. And that may or may not mean anything to you guys at this stage of the game, but this is a, a, a very well-known series by uh, a painter by the name of Joseph Albers. If you haven't heard of Joseph Albers, he was a, um, a well, he taught at the Bauhaus, came to the United States, taught at um, Black Mountain College, and after, after that, went on to teach at Yale for a good, I don't know, 40 years. Very influential color theoretician. So this homage to Square is definitely a nod to Albers by Sam Gilliam. These pieces are 60 by 60 inches each square. If you look at it, that, that lower triangle, that purple that's down there, looks like a very different purple from the purple that's up in the, the, the upper square. But I would bet money that, that, that that's the same color. It's just the context that it's in that's different, that makes it look different. Uh, and I'm gonna move on to show you two pieces from Joseph Albers. Okay, and, and again, this, this blue that's, that's out in the outer square of the, the square on the, on the right is very, very much like the square that's in the, the gray, blue-gray square that's in the center. Of the of the other one, it doesn't look like it. I know, but this is what Albers did. He would take colors 
and put them in different contexts and they would look totally different. Like that yellow square that's in the center is looks very da much darker than the yellow square that's on the outside of the one that's on the left. I would wager, <laughs> again, <laughs> you can't hold me to it, but I would wager that those two yellows are the same yellow and those two blues are the same blue. I've seen it in his work. I've seen pieces, you know, in, in exhibitions where he's, where he's playing this out. So, you know, this is very much something that, that the, the colorists of the, of the color field school were very aware of and played around with a lot in their work. Okay. And here's the man himself. Um, I think that, that this piece is, is um, one of the canvas pieces that he's fooling around with, but it could be one of the watercolors. I can't really tell if it's the cotton canvas or it's, or it's, um, it's the uh, paper watercolor pieces. Um, from the pieces in the background and from the piece that's underneath the table that he's working on, it looks like it's cotton. But I can't tell. Anyway, um, this is the process that he would go through, though. He would fold these pieces up and stain them, and they would stain through in different ways and different areas, um, really unpredictably um, in, in a way. But he would, he would use these color harmonics, and he would use different kinds of staining techniques to you know, make them work together. Um, and here are some of the watercolors. These are these are these fairly large scale pieces for watercolor. I mean, 36 by um, 72 by 36. And there's a whole series of these. These were on exhibit last fall, I believe it was in, in 2019. No, it was uh, the spring of 2019. Um, 2018. That's it. That's it. It was 2018. Um, they were they were on uh, exhibition in New York City at the Flag Foundation or something like that. And this was before the um, piece went up at Dia Beacon. Um, and the, there's a just wonderful pictures of of the gallery installation of these pieces. There were there were at least um, 30 of them in that show. So uh, were there any questions so far, Joan? No questions, although somebody did put uh, some of the websites of the pieces that you showed, um, okay. websites from the museums, but I thought, you know, you always have Something yes. at the end, so yes. I, I thought maybe not. You bet. Okay. Okay. So uh, this piece is is at the um, uh, at LaGuardia Airport, actually, and um, I I checked on the uh, hydral. <laughs> what the heck that means? And basically, it, it is the, um, the angle at, at which um, uh, airplane wings are bent out from the, from the body of the airplane. But it also means um, uh, a two-sided, something about a two-sided shape. Um, but, you know, the piece has a lot of motion to it. I mean, basically, I've never seen it. I've never, I've never seen it. I haven't been to LaGuardia in a long time. So I don't know where the heck it is in, in LaGuardia airport, but there you have it. And again, back to the mathematics and, and the whole idea of, you know, where did this come from? What, how does this guy's mind work? Uh, <laughs> It's quite remarkable. And here's here's another one of his public works. It's um, 
I believe it's a uh, Davis, you know, in in um, in California, uh, UC Davis. Um, and I, you know, uh, I deal with color all the time. This guy is is brilliant. I mean, basically to put something together like this and have it really work in the space, it's really that they're not, it's bright colors, it's buoyant, it's interesting shapes. Um, where does it come from? You know, that, that's, that's the thing. It's like these, these really, the, he must have been playing around with this thing for, for years to, to get those shapes and the interaction of those shapes. It's very different from a lot of his other pieces too. Okay. And this was a, um, an exhibition that was uh, up in uh, Rochester, uh, I believe in Rochester, New York. And um, I don't have the date on it, but, but um, beautiful in installation, the interaction of, of really very different periods of time in his work, you know, the draped pieces and the, and the, the, um, the kind of sculptural paintings. Um, very interesting stuff. And, you know, his, the diversity, I haven't even, you know, there's, there, there's so much work out there by him. They go in so many different directions, um, but they're, they're held together by color and form. There, there's an inventiveness to this, to this guy's work um, that, that is, is endless. Um, he just had a show at, uh, at Pace in actually two of the galleries in Chelsea, um, that came down in December. Uh, so none of us got to see that one either. Uh, and th that was all new work. It was brand new, you know, um, he's working with Pace Gallery. Uh, this guy's not hurting at this stage of the game. Um, he is also uh, about to, let's see, have, okay. Yeah, these pieces that are in, in this, this shot of his studio on, on, on the right, these pieces were in preparation for the show that was at Pace Gallery. There's actually a talk from Pace Gallery that if you go to the Pace Gallery uh, website, you can pull it up and, and listen to it. It's inter an interesting interview. Um, I like these pieces. I like his paintings. There's a, there's a bunch of pieces that he did that are in that show that are that are gigantic, very richly textured pieces. Hard to see online though, because basically, you know, when you're talking about almost monochromatic paintings that are dependent on the texture of the of the piece. Hard to see on a computer screen, um, but there's this great. I, I like the interview. There's an interview that I that I put over here on YouTube that is with this lady, and she kind of does a um, uh, a retrospective, and she's talking with Sam basically, um, and. He's, he's a bit hard to follow. He meanders quite a bit. And um, uh, it's, it, he, he can say some things that seem rather obscure. You gotta, you gotta really pay attention to what he's saying. Um, the, the talk, that talk was from about, I'd say about 12 years ago. Um, and the other one that's, that, that I've, I've ponied up here is from uh, Dia. And if you go to the Dia Beacon um, website, you can get to this, this YouTube 
video or you can go directly to YouTube. Larry? So, Yes. Somebody made a comment, and I'm not quite sure what she means. Okay. He says, I'm not familiar with clear field painting. Color she field. Meant color field. Okay. Yes, color field. And she's looking into color, uh, into clarification. Yeah. Mark yeah. Rothko and Barnett uh, Newman were named. Yes. Okay. So I think she needs a little clar okay. clarification on that. Okay. And she thinks his stuff is breathtaking. Yes. And she looks forward to seeing more of his wonderful work. That's color great. Free. That's but great. A little more on what a color field painter is. Okay, sure. Um, um, well, I, I went, I did show Morris Lewis and, and Kenneth Nolan earlier in the presentation. Those two guys typify color field painting. Okay. Basically, it comes out of somebody like um, um, Helen Frankenthaler who actually, um, n not, not this month, but n next month, um, I, I am gonna be doing a, a um, talk on her. It's either next month or the month after. There's and a you know show Larry, on. She's my favorite. There's a show on <laughs> um, in, um, in Connecticut at the New Britain Museum of her late work. And I'll just use that as, a, as an excuse to explore Helen Frankenthaler's work a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> but um, um, so the color field painters, yes, Mark Rothko um, and, and um, uh, I'd say- Barnett well, Newman? Yeah, Barnett Newman does does enter sort of into that category, but more Rothko than 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 Newman. Though Newman was one who, see, Newman was actually influenced by the color field painters too. It kind of they fed back and forth between each other. So Newman was still alive when these guys were painting, so he saw what they were doing and took on some of that stuff. Um, even somebody like Robert Motherwell, in his work, it, later work in the in the eighties, was was looking back and forth at these at these at these guys, um, and seeing some stuff there that he might be able to use. Um, so if you look at some of Motherwell's later work, it does enter into this business of very minimal um, uh, mark making big areas of color interacting that's it's it's not as gestural or emotional as 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 the abstract expressionist painters were i mean if you look at somebody like de kooning it's it's very visceral it's very much about how the paint is slapped on there um and and even even somebody like pollock the gesture, the, the, the body motion gets into the painting. Well, these guys were, were into much cooler painting. Um, now, Sam is, is kind of after that first wave of color field. So he wasn't afraid to show emotion. He wasn't afraid to have, you know, the gesture have some, some, record of his handprint okay um and 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 one of the reasons why he is so relevant right now is a lot of young abstract painters are looking at this stuff and saying yeah hey why not i can do any of this stuff you know if you look at again another one is is this business of of um Somebody like uh, Gerhard Richter, who I covered a, a, a while back, um, his work can be kind of categorized as color field. Um, the abstract paintings are really these large areas of, of, of mark making that's not done by brush. It's, it's a squeegee, it's a, a mark making implement. Um, so, yeah, uh, good question. Thank you. <laughs> okay. 
All right, I think that would do it. This was right. very interesting. I mean, I've been to Dia Beacon and I've seen his work, but this, he really has very different ways that he goes. His, oh yeah. He's all over the place. So. Yes. Oh, the, that's the other thing that I wanted to say. Up here, watch for, for upcoming retrospective at the Hirshhorn Museum in 2022. They're going to have a career long survey of his work at the Hirshhorn. So it's gonna be a huge show. You know, the guy is 86 now, I believe. Let's see, he was born in 33. So um, I guess it's- 87. 87. Eight. eight. Yep, pushing yeah. 87. Uh, so he'll be he'll be 88 or 89 yeah. if he's still around right. when this when this thing rolls around. I'm looking forward to it, and hopefully by 22 we'll be able to go to DC and see it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, hope to see you at the programs that we're having, upcoming programs. And again, if you want to have your name um, put on my mailing list, just email J K U H N at W L S Mail dot org. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.